you are described by many people who know racing as an institution yourself because it's a lifetime you've spent in the game. Some people don't live that long. But <laughs> it must be very, very hard for you to say goodbye. But the, the chapter of Ormond Ferraris as a licensed trainer is, so to speak, over. Yeah, Andrew, I'm leaving it on a rather sad note. You know, I wanted to just retire in a bit of peace, but uh, the grooms have made it intolerable. I can't work like this. I'm used to using one groom for two horses. Most of the guys are now three horses to a groom, but mine weren't happy with that. They had to join the strike on Saturday, and the strike was about giving this guy, this unionist, or whatever you'd like to call him, he wanted officers in Pumalela. Had absolutely nothing to do with me, the trainers, or the grooms. But we had no labour for the whole of Saturday morning till two o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm not prepared to accept it. I've set a high code throughout my life, and I want to maintain it. Before we get to the, the beginning part of your life, the end part of your life reveals that after 67 years of training, You've never, ever, ever had one positive call from the National Horse Racing Authority. Yeah, I think that's a, a unique and I think a very, very good record, I would say. To me, that, that spells complete vigilance because if you're watching over your animals so closely, people say that their horses can get spiked or that there's sabotage and all the rest of it, but it, it shows that your attention to detail is really the love of the horse. Absolutely, from beginning to end. And You've just got to keep your eye on everything and, and you, you know, I've never played golf in my life. My life has been a stable. Uh, a lot of owners have appreciated and a lot of others haven't. But uh, that's been my life. As Michael de Kock says, leaving the army and coming to work for you was very similar because he says you were like a sergeant major. It was either black or white. There was, there was no grey area and... I guess that's the way it has to be for a horse. Well, I think that's a proper way to run a yard. You know, you can't, it's not a hit and miss affair. You've got to have a hands on it all the time. That's what it's all about. You've got to study your horses individually. Some eat more than others, they've got to get less work. And that's the whole beginning to end. Well, the interesting thing for me is that we've had these dynasties, um, whether it's the Snaiths or it's the Millards, or the Canamayas, there are many of them in South Africa. Michael de Kock was a guy that never had a racing background. David Ferraris was born into a racing background. They've, they've both achieved incredible things for South Africa, um, and I don't think that you can put one before the other. Yeah, you know, uh, I had David as an assistant, and he was very dedicated because he had to do his Air Force training. So he travelled through every day to Pretoria, or Valhalla, whatever the place was called. Came back here, first stop to, uh, was the stable, said, Dad, can I help you with anything? And then him and Michael went to Alberton High, and uh, I didn't need another assistant. I mean, I've only had 60 horses for three parts of my life. And David said, oh, Dad, he's been a friend of mine, and won't you please help him? He's terribly keen. You can even cut my salary. So I said, no, David, well, I don't want to do that, but all right, if you think so, we'll give him. He can look after the one barn, you the other, and I the other. That's the three barns, the 60 horses. And I noticed from day one, Mike did have something in him. He had something in him. He was keen as mustard, and he watched every move and took it in. Going back to your career, you, you're licensed as a trainer in 1952. What kind of background horse knowledge did you have? Well, at school I had a friend, uh, Mike McLean. Uh, his father had the McLean's Coal Agency in Germany. And they had a farm out there and they had horses. And I rode with him and everything. We used to do daring things on horses. My uncle, which is my mother's brother, he, he was a jockey, Arthur Victor, and he rode in Kimberley. They came from Kimberley and that's where he rode. So there was racing in my blood. I was terribly keen on becoming a jockey, but weight problems were against me. Um, 
I joined George Wheel. He was at that, well, he passed his best then, but he did train for all the greats of the turf. Solly Joel's, Geoffrey Joel, Hugh Wyndham, all those greats. A thorough gentleman, and he knew his part. Once in those days, if you had weight problems, uh, the jockey club would send for you and say, listen, lad, you're, you're going to have weight problems, find another career. There was no courts or all that. You wouldn't dare even attempt anything like that. You were out. And I remember my dad going to wheel and he said, well, what, what am I going to do with this boy? You know, I don't want him to be, to be a bum on the race course. He said, wheel said, don't worry about that. He can be my assistant. He can have all the grounding in the world and he can take over. And that's how my career started in racing. So there was actually no, so to speak, academy where you went and you learned the no. fundamental. You know, as kids those days, there was no uh, TV and all that business. You know, you, you hung around stables, you begged the grooms, can we ride this horse? Can we ride this horse? And that's how it was. No academy, not at all. You, you apprenticed to each trainer. And each trainer in those days had about three or four youngsters. There was a hell of a lot of them. Naturally, three quarters didn't make it because of weight problems. But that obviously meant when you became assistant trainer that there was, there was no formal structure, that there was a lot of mucking out and a lot of basic work or... No, no, I was in the yard. I did work in the yard and everything. And from there I made the step higher up. So in other words, it was a thirst for knowledge because knowledge is power and the more you know, the better you're going to be. Well, I think it was the keenness that a person showed. I wanted to be with horses. That was it. The private nature of Orman Ferraris, is that something that has been with you your whole life, minding your own business, getting on with what you have to do and not worrying about what other people are saying or doing? Or Andrew, I think I learned that from the boss himself, from George Wheel. He was a very quiet man. When he raised his voice, you were in trouble. But other than that, he was quiet, he gave you the work, set it out, and you, were, you did it, and reported back to him. I would imagine that there was such a measure of respect for seniority and for people that set a good example for you. There was no challenging the system. Not at all, not by any manner or means. You dare not challenge it, not at all. So the people that have passed through, through your hands, um, the Michael de Cox, the David Ferraris, the Waiho Mowings, Waishong Mowing obviously speaks enormously highly of, of what he's learned from you. Sharon Cotson, give us some of the names of people that have worked with Orman Ferraris. Well, that's, a, that's about it. There was a lot, I've had quite a few apprentices through my hands too, you know, through the years. They all turned out pretty good too. Toby from Burma? Yeah, you made him a top uh, apprentice of his year, top jockey too. He won the championship and that. He probably gave me the hardest time of my life, a very difficult Hollander to work with. <laughs> my first winner was with, actually with, under Mr. Wheel, a horse called Hitchknot by Slipknot. He went on to win 10 races, a great little horse. So that was my very first winner in my colours, but under wheel. Those colours still in evidence today? Yes, I took them over when the old man passed away. I took them over black with a scarlet sash. They've been, they were first registered in this country in 1910. And I've had them for a, ever since the old man passed away. It's not your start to keep a record of how many winners you've had in those colours, but they've been They've been very lucky colours, nevertheless. Yeah, they're lovely colours. You can pick them up miles away. Well, I suppose it's quite ironic, in a way, that they're almost identical to the colours of Mrs Oppenheimer if you swap the red and the yellow. And that's probably one of the horses in your latter years that, that must have given you enormous pleasure in cherry on the top. Absolutely, yes. Oh, great, gratefully to train, gratefully. How did it happen that you ended up training cherry on the top? Because you, you hadn't had those colours in your yard before. Never. I'd, be, I'd trained for many, many years, as you know. I'd never had a chance to train for the Oppenheimers. I don't know the reason why or when, but um, they were looking for a stud man. 
and I think it was Anne Upton. She phoned me up, Anne, and she said, oh, Mrs. Oppenheimer is really desperate for a stud manager. So I said, well, I might know the right man. And I, I thought of Guy Murdoch, a good Karoo man, knows the conditions well of the Karoo. And she gave him a job. She was absolutely so chuffed that I got him for her. And she says, look, I'm going to send you a, a horse. Anyway, two arrived, and one was Terry on top, and the other one a Philly Aaron, which I also won five or six races with. And that was the first I ever trained for the Oppenheimers. And obviously that connection with Guy Murdoch must have been because of your own breeding experience in that part of the world, in Middleburg. And Guy had left Gary Players and had gone down to KwaZulu-Natal, which... Of course it was a, a money move, but it wasn't necessarily a move for life. No, and it, it wasn't. I think once you're a Karoo man, you're always a Karoo man. And I think, uh, you know, Guy is a Karoo man. So I don't think he was happy at Moy River. So it came just right for him. That's maybe why horse racing is so intriguing, because the, the fabric and the fibre of the story can be so interwoven. They can... You can link from one thing to the next without without too much difficulty. There's always a turn around the corner. It's an amazing game, it's amazing. And when you seem to be in the depth of despair and a bunch of yearlings come in, one of them turns out a, a, a top horse. Well, <clears throat> when I think about it now, um, the enormous amount of research and dedication that is prevalent in the Lithgow family, both with the late Jimmy and with Aidan Lithgow, who have done an incredible job with this Legend series that hasn't really necessarily got the right airtime just yet. I'm sure that there are a lot of technical loopholes, and it will in due course. But I find it so difficult to find all that old footage of your early part of career. And the first time that I really remember as a youngster seeing Ormond Ferraris rise to the fore, because I lived in KwaZulu-Natal, was of course down in 1975, I think it was, with Distinctly, who wasn't a very big horse, but he was a very game horse, a very courageous horse, and subjected to a, a rather big bullying in that July. <laughs> yeah, well, that was very unfortunate. I had a good patron, uh, Morty Zimmerman. He was big shot in a group, uh, motor group, and that was the end of him. He was so bitterly disappointed about that race. He gave up racing. But, Andrew, I had, in 1955, I trained my first group winner, a little horse called Saint Memo in the South African Guineas. We took him down in our own f little float and towed him with a car. And he beat Commonwealth, who'd won about six in a row, six or seven in a row. Uh, Bobby Palm rode him for us. So that was my first group winner in 55. A relation of Colin Palm? They were actually brothers. Brothers, eh? Yeah. yeah. You've got... Ten oaks to your credit. You've got eight South African derbies, many big race winners. Obviously, the the, the Rothmans July, Vodacom Durban July, call it what you like, is, has been as much of a hoodoo to you as it has been to Jeff Lloyd. You find the place boxes on several occasions, but it just hasn't clicked for you. Yeah, I think that's just a good why. Why Shang also a great rider, he hasn't won the July. I think it just happens like that. Charlie Berenz was a great rider. He had one July winner. Mace and then he won about seven gold cups. Absolutely. And yeah. Mace Roberts was another one. Yes. You know. It had to be your son to give him the July <laughs> winner in 1997. Yes, it's amazing. <laughs> it's just one of those races. I think it can elude people, and as it has me, unfortunately, but there you are. I think one of the great owners I've trained for was Paddy Hinton, an uh, uh, absolute gentleman a great sportsman, and he left everything to me. And um, when they opened up South African overseas racing to South Africans, we were the first to go over. They gave us a free air passage and hotel. And I remember so well, he was a big guy, you'd probably remember him, you know. Big, that big voice. Big voice, loud as they come and broad as they come. And uh, they played for our ordinary passage, but he converted his to a first class because he says he couldn't fit in the bloody seat. Fair enough. And when we got over there, he was dead beat. I think, no doubt, carrying too much overweight. Anyway, I said, no, no, I, 
I've never slept in the day in my life. I ain't going to do it now. I'm going to take a walk around. So I caught a taxi, went to the sail ring. The first row I walked through, because we had decided between him and I that we've got to try and get a last tycoon. He was such a good racehorse and I thought, hell, what an asset he'd be here. Yeah. He's progeny anyway. And I walked, the first line I walked through, and I wasn't, he had a beautiful girl looking after her, but I wasn't looking at her, I was looking at the horse. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, this filly, how she stood out. And I got back, Hinton had woken up on then, was having his scotch late afternoon or wherever it was. And I said, Paddy, I've seen the horse for us. He says, what is it? I said, it is a last tycoon. Oh, he says, I think they'll go too high for us. I said, well, we'll have a go. Let's, let's try. And we got her for 100,000 100, guineas. And look what a great filly she turned out to be. Absolute superstar. And a pleasure to train. I've had such good fillies. And all of them, I must say, bar for one, their nature has been superb. They've just got, they're above the others with a wonderful nature. Cherry on the top, I think you could walk under her belly, tickle her, do what you like. She, she wouldn't even turn her hair. That's remarkable because yeah. we all know that Tiger Ridge wasn't exactly the easiest of customers. Yeah, and she was an absolute lamb. Now, Tracy's element, she landed in South Africa the same year as another last tycoon filly called Super Sheila. And I remember one day there were four horses in a race, two South African horses and two Aussie horses. And the two South African horses were trailing in their wake, something like 20, 25 lengths behind Tracy's element to beat Super Sheila. And that particular pedigree of, of Tracy's element has, has proliferated many champions in Australia. Oh, she's turned out a great brood, mate. Great. I mean, she's thrown Group 1 winners in Australia. That's saying something, you know. Not too many horses go back from here to Australia and throw that. Tracy's Elements, the leader. Prince of War is reeling her in on the outside, but Tracy's Element is still going it. Prince of War's catching slowly, in fact, with each and every stride in a great finish. And it's close, I think. Tracy's Element won it. Tracy's, Tracy's Element is still on the lead. Lady Lexington on her inside, got a length and a half to make up. On the far side is Young Harvest. Tracy's Element and Young Harvest, a big runner down the inside in hot seven as they come down to the wire. Tracy's Element. Jockeys, I mean, you've spoken so highly of Jeff Lloyd. He's a legend in his own right. Pierce Stratham's written for you, Wyshong Marwing, Anthony Delpesh. I mean, there's been no shortage of help from the saddle. You've had the best. I think you've got to use the best, you know. You can't always get the best, but you've got to... For big races, I think you really need it. They just need that extra bit of help. You know, there's not a vast difference. I mean, a lot of people condemn jockeys. But there's not a vast difference, I would say, two lengths between the top jockey and the middle distance, the middle jockey. No more. So how was it as a matter of interest that uh, Naresh Juglal ended up being aboard your Triple Tiara Victress? Well, he was riding for Clinton Burner. And you know, Clinton Burner, uh, he only got uh, sprinters, I think, that being the nature of his track, track that he's yeah. got there. Yeah. And I thought this kid got a nice seat and he sits quietly. And he came and I gave him a few chances and he listened to me. And that's how I, I kept him on that filly. Because I remember Mrs. O, I, I went to see her and I said, you know, this filly's got a chance for this triple Tahara. Uh, do you mind if I keep this kid on? Because he knows the filly and she seems to run. He says, she said, by all means, he's done well, keep him on. The generations of, uh, of passion in this game have extended through to David's son. A young man, light years ahead of his time and always able to keep his feet in the ground at this relatively early stage of his life. You produced the very first winner for this young man. Yeah, well, I think, uh, I think if I hadn't have, I don't know who would have shot me uh, David or Pam, you know, so, uh, but it's been a pleasure to work with the kid. I've given him opportunities. He's thrown a few away, which you've got to expect. He's only a 17-year-old lad, uh, but he listens and his head is screwed on right. Um, I think a natural. He's got a lovely pair of hands 
and he can sit and wait, which is a big thing in his favour. And you've never really been one to stand on your soapbox and jump for joy, but there have been a couple of moments that I've witnessed that have been truly memorable, and, and that was one particular day with you standing with Luke and David. It, it must have been a, a warm, fuzzy feeling, the like of which you probably hadn't felt before. No, it's given me renewed interest, this youngster, you know, because racing, as you know, is not what it used to be. It's lost that enthusiasm, that zest, that keenness that people used to, oh, we're going to the races, dress up, woman in their hats, smartly dressed. We've lost it all. It's gone. I don't think it'll ever return, unfortunately. So this kid has given me renewed interest, and I'm very pleased for David and Pat. And that must have been even more difficult for you to say, I, I, I actually don't want to hang up my boots, even though I'm 87 years young. Um, but the reality is that the stress of, of seeing these horses compromised must have been the deciding factor. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. I'm not prepared at this stage of my life, of my career, to lower my standards and just accept whatever they want to dish up. No.